All right, so it's December 20, 2013, and our subject is justification by faith, the gospel. And yeah, this time we're coming at it looking again. I know we looked at this last week at these couple of verses, but we want to expand on it more. At um, Galatians 2, uh, from verses 15 till verse 17, perhaps, though the thought continues till verse 21, the end of the chapter. But before we kind of get into it, I want to explain why we're looking at this still and extending this rather than going on to the next verses. Um, we learned before that the book of Galatians was very likely the first book of the New Testament to be written. And we spent a good deal of time looking into the conditions that called forth the necessity for this letter to be written. And we found out the purpose of the letter to point out specifically what the true gospel is in opposition to any false gospel or a perversion of the gospel. And we saw, again, the subject of Galatians is the gospel, which is justification by faith, which is righteousness by faith. And faith is believing in the word to do what the word says. And righteousness we, thought, we saw to be uh, right doing or observance of the law. And so it's becoming righteous. And if we break one commandment, we break them all. We, we look at all this and how it's truly being free from sin, according to Romans 6 and other places. So it's being freed from sin by faith. Being freed from sin, not by any works of any law, but by faith. So we saw that's the subject of the book. So again, this is the first, most likely at least, the first book of the New Testament, so far as we know. It, as A.T. Jones pointed out in Studies in Galatians, if any one book of the Bible could be said to be the one that presents the gospel most in its purity, it would be the book of Galatians. Now, in the book of Galatians, Paul starts with defending his apostleship and answering to accusations that were set forth to him and against him and against the gospel which he preached. So he spends most of chapter 1 and chapter 2 answering these objections. And in fact, you could say the whole of chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now, when we get to verse 11 of chapter 2, we see that there is a controversy not only with these quote-unquote Pharisees which believe that we see in Acts 15, who could be known as converts to belief in Yeshua as Messiah from among the Shammai sect of the sect of the Pharisees, who likely were later known as the Ebionites when they split from Nazarene Judaism, which was again the original followers of the Messiah. Now, what we see is that it wasn't only these men who were the controversy involved. It was also Peter and James because they were influenced by what these men taught. And we went through why that is and some of the records of that in the Bible before, so we won't take the time to do it now. But in verse 11, you see Paul says that he withstood Peter face to face or to the face, and uh, there's this controversy, and he basically rebukes Peter because he walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel which is found in verse 14 of Galatians 2. Then in verse 15 is where he starts to really lay out what the gospel is. So this is the thing. Verses, starting at verse 15, verses 15 to 21, out of all the record that we have in New Testament scripture, this is the first place where we find the word justification. This is the first place where Paul is endeavoring to set forth the gospel in clarity. Now, when we look at this, we're going to find out how this connects 
to, you know, how Paul explained himself further on these same points in his later writings. For example, the book of Romans is about the same subject as the book of Galatians, as well as justification by faith, but it's discussing justification by faith, particularly as it relates to the moral law. The book of Hebrews is discussing the same subject as Galatians, justification by faith, but as it relates to the ceremonial law, or the typical service. And so this is, you know, this is why it's important to take some time to really understand what this particular passage is saying, Galatians 2:15 to 21, because this is really the first time that the gospel was being set forward in its clarity. So, it's a very important statement, and I just want to mention, for those of you who are wanting to be sharing the gospel, this is definitely a good meeting to be taking notes uh, during, because in this meeting, you know, what we're endeavoring to do is to show from the scripture what justification is in itself, what justification by faith is as opposed to anything else and really try to just grasp it and understand it and show it in as much clarity as possible so there can be no question as to what the gospel is. So just to kind of have a little bit more detailed understanding of what's going on in the previous verses before verse 15, Again, we saw the controversy between Paul and Peter and the and also James and those with them, and how Barnabas was also carried away. You know, it's worth emphasizing that the issue at hand in verse fourteen is that Peter was not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. And we saw that the gospel is justification by faith. So if Peter was walking not uprightly according to the gospel, whatever he was saying or doing was not in harmony with justification by faith. So it's really important to keep in mind that that is the issue at hand because lots of times people <clears throat> will take the, you know, the part B of verse 14 and divorce it from the context of what preceded it and what follows after it. So part B says, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest to thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So lots of people take that and say, oh, well, you know, Peter, when he was among the Gentiles, he didn't keep the law of God. He didn't, he didn't eat kosher. He didn't keep the Sabbath. He didn't keep the feast days. He didn't do all the things that we're told to do in the instructions given to Moses and the prophets since. But many people interpreted that he was basically living like the heathen live in his practices in daily life. And that when the Jews came, he started keeping the law again, and that that was the issue. And Paul was saying, well, why are you keeping the law? You shouldn't be keeping the law. You know, you're dra dragging people into bondage, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a very common interpretation. But we'll see exactly why that is an impossible reading of the text, at least impossible for it to be true. And that's we'll get into that more in a, a couple of minutes, exactly why that is. But... Just notice the part at the beginning is according to the truth of the gospel. And then after that, in verse 16, you can see that the main issue is whether we are justified by faith or by works. It's not whether we are justified or whether we are not justified. Because remember what justification is. Justification is being made righteous. And being made righteous is being made obedient to the law. So the controversy wasn't that 
Peter was saying, oh no, we don't need to be justified. We don't need to be made obedient to the law. It was the matter of how someone becomes free from sin. How someone becomes obedient to the law. And again, sin is transgression of the law. Free from sin is free from transgressing the law, which is the same as being made obedient to the law. So, it's important to keep in mind that that was the real controversy. Now, something else I want to point out that A.T. Jones points out. Uh, he says that it is next to impossible to figure out where Paul's uh, dialogue to Peter ends and his explanation of justification by faith to the Galatians begins. And this, I see why he's saying that. He said, you know, because the subject of both were the same. You know, with Peter, he was trying to show him again the gospel which he once knew. And with the Galatians, Paul was trying to show them the gospel which they once knew. Now, just to have a little bit more understanding of that than A.C. Jones did perhaps, it's probably likely that from verses 15 to 21, that that is what uh, Paul was actually saying to Peter, but that he's using that as his main point to launch into his discussion of the gospel to the Galatians. And there's a few reasons why that's the most likely case. One is that the Galatians were Gentiles, and you can show this really easily just by you know, going through the book. And in verse 15, when he speaks to Peter, he says, we who are Jews by birth and not the uh, Gentile sinners or sinners of the Gentiles, you know, et cetera, et cetera, he's kind of speaking in an inclusive way, which would make it seem that both he and the one or ones who he's speaking to are Jews. And he continues that way of speaking uh, until the end of the chapter. And, you know, he says, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith. You know, which is the same thing as even we as they, we can be saved even as they in Acts 15. And that was the same language and there was discussion among the Jews. The other thing is the parallels between verse 16 and Acts 15, verses 7 to 11, I believe it is, where Peter is giving his explanation of the gospel. And Paul is basically repeating the truth that Peter once proclaimed to Peter in, almost, in, in very similar words. And so that's what he's proclaiming to Peter. Also, when we get to chapter 3, is in verse 1 is when it says, O foolish Galatians. So it's like the direction is turned to specifically address the Galatians. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because it's important to know the nature of the rebuke that was given to Peter in order, in order to really understand what was at stake and what the controversy was really about. So that's kind of a summary of kind of the setup. It looks like Chris is about to be on, so once he gets on, we can start from verse 15 and really try to get a, a good understanding of this. And we may only get through to the end of verse 17 because we're going to take the time to look at a number of other passages in the scriptures to really make this clear. Um, and then perhaps tomorrow evening we'll go from verses 18 to verse 21. But we'll see exactly how things go and where our Heavenly Father leads. Also, I, I'll just mention, uh, Teresa's been sending out uh, Wagner Bible studies on the Book of Romans. And those studies, you'll since she's sending them out to you all, you'll have them in email. 
uh, and hopefully, yeah, you will get a chance to read it sometime soon, but if not, you'll have it there and can read it whenever. But, yeah, it really, you know, in reading it, it was just like, wow, okay. It's just such confirmation <laughs> that the gospel that we've received is the true gospel. And it, it does go into, it definitely goes into things that we haven't studied specifically or into particular passages. So one second here. Looks like Chris just sent me a message or typed it in here. Okay, I'm just typing him a comment telling him how to get on audio. So hopefully he'll get that and make it on for you. Uh, Chet, yeah, um, I'm on here with uh, Chris on the phone, so you guys go ahead and we'll try to work it out on the... Uh technical side here. Okay, sure. All right, so we'll just continue on then. All right, so um, would somebody like to actually read, um, let's see, verses 14 to 21? And, you know, again, just, just before that, it's talking about how Paul withstood Peter to the face, and that he, uh, when the Jews came from James, he didn't eat with the Gentiles anymore like he did before, and that the Jews dissembled them, and uh, Barnabas was also taken away with their dissimulation. So if someone could read from verses 14 to 21, that would be awesome. I'll read it. Okay, thank you. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Thank you so much for reading that. What we're going to do is go through from verse 15 and understand a few things, but we're going to probably focus mostly on verse 17. So I'm not going to, we're not going to read all the verses that we could at this time, but I'll reference a number of them to you. Welcome, Michael. We're in Galatians chapter 2, verses uh, 15 to 21. All right, so... What we see here in Galatians 2 is that Peter was not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. And so Paul says to him, We who are Jews by birth are not Gentile sinners, knowing that a man is not justified by works of law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ in order that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by works of law. For by works of law shall no flesh be justified. Now, you'll all notice that I read that a little, little bit differently than it reads in King James, and that's because uh, in the Greek text of Galatians, the definite article in verse 16 is lacking in every instance preceding the words works and law. So it's not justified, you know, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, 
but a man is not justified by works of the law. And the thought there, as we discussed previously, is that Paul isn't trying to point to some specific law by which we cannot be justified. For that would leave open the question of us possibly being justified by some other law. The real purpose is that no one can be justified by any works of any law, but only by the faith of Christ. And the word types then thought it interesting that through the law we are dead to the law. And we'll definitely get to that verse. I know there's lots of confusion about it, but we'll get to exactly what it means. But it's a preaching of gospel, that's for sure. So notice it's important to capture the, the meaning behind what is being said here. The purpose of Paul's statement is that, look, even us who are Jews and have the privilege and the advantage of all these laws that God gave, even we who have all these laws could not be justified by them and must be justified by the faith of Christ. So again, the Jews certainly have advantage of the law. Romans 3 verses 1 and 2 says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Right? They had the instruction given from our heavenly family. They had these laws, and that is certainly an advantage. And of course, in Romans 9, though we won't read it now, but if you read uh, Romans 9, verses 1 to 5, it's very clear that the Jews have the advantage of, you know, to them pertains the adoption of the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and promises, etc., etc. So there is advantage in Israel. They have been given things that they were supposed to take to the rest of the world, but they were given things that they themselves uniquely had. And unfortunately, it stayed that way because of the lack that was in them of receiving the righteousness of God, that they may take that righteousness to the other nations. Um, another passage for those of you who are writing notes, uh, that's uh, good showing again the advantage of the Jew being the law, is Romans 2, 17 to 20. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 to 20. So, with that, again, the point that's being made is we who are Jews by nature, we who were born Jews, and not Gentile sinners, not saying that they're not sinners at all. He's saying that they're not Gentile sinners. And the purpose of that is that sin is transgression of the law. And the Gentiles don't have those laws. So they're not Gentile sinners. Now, he's pointing out this contrast between Jews who have the law and Gentiles who do not have the law. But again, verse 16, knowing that a man, so we who are Jews by birth, and not Gentile sinners, not from among Gentile sinners, knowing that a man is not justified by works of law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we, even we who have all the advantages of all these laws, hath believed on Jesus Christ in order that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by works of law. For by works of law shall no flesh be justified. So it's a fairly simple point, but it's one very important to grasp a hold of. That, you know, it was, it was absolute proof that we are not justified by law. In other words, the fact that the Gentiles were justified without any law and that even the Jews who did have those laws had to believe in Christ in order to be justified by his faith. That in itself was also proof that 
it's justification by faith, not justification by law. And that by works of law, no flesh can be justified. And we went into the reasons of why that did before. We read Romans 3, 19 to 28, and we saw that everyone has gone out of the way, no one has their own righteousness. And because of that, if people aren't righteous, they are free from righteousness, Romans 6, 20. And that if they are breaking even one law, they break the law, James 2, 10. And that cursed is everyone that continueth in God in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's Galatians 3.10, quoting Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. You know, all these passages are showing us that if someone is breaking the law in the practical life, even just one commandment, if someone has any sin in their life, they are transgressors of the entire law, and that because of that, because people are sold under sin, they have no works that they can do in order to be justified. Because all their works are free from righteousness. So, in other words, to say that someone could be justified by works is to say that someone, by doing unrighteous acts, could become righteous. It's like, it's like the thought of throwing mud on a plate to make it clean. You know, it doesn't really make sense. And so, it's, um, that's really the issue that the hand that Paul is addressing, that it's impossible to be justified by works. And then, again, in uh, verse 17, which is kind of where we're going to focus, it says, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. So we have to, let's look at this and try to understand the thought conveyed in that verse. It says, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ. And many, if not all of us here, know what that experience is. Learning about the gospel finding out that there is a such thing as justification by faith, finding out what justification by faith is. And then we seek that. We seek that justification by faith. And it says, but if while we seek to be justified by faith, we ourselves also are found sinners. And of course, in the context here, we ourselves also, Paul is talking about, we ourselves as those who know the law, as those who have the privilege of the truth, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Now, I just want to point out the the main issue in as far as the people in Paul's day, the main issue that they were concerned with is that they were using the law as a means of justification. Today, and, and Lorna has pointed this out before, um, many people use an understanding of the scriptures or an understanding of a message or truth to be what justifies them. Or, you know, you're saved because you've accepted the truth and et cetera, et cetera. So this is the thing, you know, just like we are no longer under the law after we are justified, we're no longer under the prophets after we're justified. And just as being justified does not do away with the law, but it establishes the law, just so being justified does not do away with the prophets, but it establishes the prophets. In other words, when people try to use the law as a means of justification, they're actually destroying the purpose of the law. And that's what it means to be under the law. You know, when someone's under the condemnation of the law, because they are breaking the law by trying to use it as a means of justification. So when someone is trying to uh, use the messages that come through the prophets as a means of justification, it's doing away with the whole purpose of the prophets were sent. Because the purpose of the prophets is to point people to Christ as Savior and God as justified. And so it's really 
while someone is trying to uplift the messages of the prophet by trying to be justified by a belief in the truth, or at least the theory of it that the prophets proclaim, while someone is doing that, they're really destroying the whole purpose of what the prophets were sent for. But when if someone is justified by faith, they establish the prophets. They establish the messages that have come by the prophets. Why? Because the truth can only be the truth in as much and insofar as it is connected and is part of the gospel, which is justification by faith. So if we preach or believe or live by anything else than justification by faith, we automatically disregard the prophets. But when we accept justification by faith, that is the only way to lift up the prophets and the messages of the prophets, because that's the only way to have the messages in their true settings. So I wanted to expand on that a little bit there, to try and bring it home to a little bit more present truth application. So, anyways, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? So notice, some may, you know, to Paul, they may have brought the accusation, saying, well, you're saying that we must be justified without law, which is what it says in Galatians 3.28. Justified without law, saved on the ground of the Gentiles. So if you're doing that, you're a sinner because you're not, you don't have the law, you're saying you're a breaker of the law, so therefore you're a sinner. And if Christ is, if that's the way Christ saves, then Christ is a minister of sin. That's kind of the argument against Paul. That if the way Christ saves people is not at all by works of law, but totally without works of law, then someone is completely and wholly a sinner, and the accusation is, well, if that's the way Christ saves you, then Christ is making you a sinner. Go ahead, Lorna. Yes, um, that's, that's what was happening there, that argument, that if we, if we give up the law and we go by faith, then we're, you know, we're, we're going to be sinners. Yeah. Am I hearing that that's the same thing that the leaders in 1888 were saying? Yeah, they they were misunderstanding what Jones and Wagner were saying just as much as many of these people understood what Paul was saying. They thought that it was degrading and throwing out the law. Mm -hmm. And that somehow they would, by doing that, they would make themselves sinners or better yet, Christ would have, you know, Christ would have been the means by which they became sinners. Right, exactly. And that's, that's because if they were going to say, okay, well, we must be justified by faith in Christ without the works of any law, they must acknowledge themselves as being truly without works of law. As in, what what people have to do when they are seeking to be justified by Christ is Christ shows them their sins so they can see, hey, wait a second, I'm not actually a Sabbath keeper. I'm not actually a peacekeeper. I'm not actually a whatever it may be. But then they see that if they're not justified, all their works are works of the flesh, which is lying, the truth, maliciousness, you know, all these different things, variance murder, hate, envy, you know, and when someone sees themselves as that, they see themselves as a sinner. And so, whereas, if someone has the comfort of thinking, well, at least I'm a Sabbath keeper, even though, yeah, I might lie here and there, or I might, you know, whatever it may be, they're still a, a law keeper, they're not a sinner, because they're, they're keeping the law, you know. But when someone is brought face to face while seeking to be justified by Christ, by faith, then they can't rest in any keeping of the law. And they are indeed seeing themselves as sinners. Uh -huh. So it is true that we must totally and utterly throw out the law as a means of justification. But just because we disregard law as means of justification does not mean that we disregard law completely. 
And that is why Paul says, God forbid. You know, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Is therefore Christ the minister of lawlessness? Is therefore Christ throw out the law? God forbid. The law is not thrown out because we're justified without law. So, Leroy, he typed in, so can we say we are saved without works of law? Yes, we're totally saved without works of law. In fact, it's the only way to, yeah, it's the only way to be justified. And in, in other words, what is being saved? <laughs> being saved is going from being lawless to being lawful, from being a breaker of law to being a keeper of law. So what that shows you is that if someone isn't saved, how could they be saved by works of law? Because they have no works of law. Mm -hmm. They only have a, or I should say, they don't have the works of the law. All they have is the idea of works of law. You know, but all those works are unrighteousness. So then when the true gospel is preached, it's then that we really know that we can't keep the law. So true. On our own, that is. Yeah, oh, totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I sent out an email, this thing about Peter walking on the water, that I found while scanning through things. And it beautifully shows how, you know, it was impossible for Peter to walk on water, and it's impossible for us to keep the commandments. But then it goes through and shows how Peter did walk on the water by faith, and how we keep the commandments by faith. It was a nice parallel. So, yeah, it's, that's the issue that was happening in the days of Paul. That's the issue that's happening in 1888. And that's the issue that's still happening today. Well, then, really, the, the preaching of present truth acts just the same way. It's when we come up against present truth and that we have to apply it in the present, mm -hmm. then is when we know we don't have the power to apply it. Right. Without, without justification. Amen. Right. So we're made, we come up against our weakness in terms of actually living present truth when it is free. Oh, so true. So true. I mean, the gospel itself reveals the utter inability within man to obey it and keep it. However, it shows the complete ability in Christ and that we can accept Christ and that in Christ we will be made keepers of the law. And so that's, I mean, to put it in some more present truth terminology and things that we've been discussing lately, you know, here we are seeking to be justified by Christ and are found sinners. In other words, here we are seeking to have our dry bones resurrected and we find that our bones are utterly dry and that we are completely cut off. But even though there's no hope inside of us, there is hope in Christ. So in other words, someone today might look at this and say, oh, here you are, you're proclaiming this message of dry bones and by proclaiming this message of dry bones, you just make yourself a sinner. Because here you are saying, everyone's a sinner, and you know, that includes yourself. You're just making yourself a sinner by teaching this message of the dry bones and of the resurrection. But just because it's true that someone, while seeking to be justified, is found a sinner, just because that's true, does that make Christ the minister of sin? And that is what is God forbid, because justification, rather than being the thing which does away with the law, justification is the only thing which establishes the law. And that's what it says in uh, Romans 3.31. It says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. That's the same thought in verse 17 of Galatians 2. Establishing law by faith, not making void the law. 
by Christ. So again, it's the thought there is that is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. And the reason why is because it is absolutely necessary to accept the righteousness of Christ in order to be set free from sin. So notice this verse, verse 17 of the previous, this is the first time we see justification. So what we're going to do to help us understand this verse, verse 17, even better is to look at some passages which help us define things. Let's see what justification itself is. And we can start with the meaning of the word. The word justification in itself means to be made righteous. Justified means made righteous. In Habakkuk, where it says, the just shall live by faith, Habakkuk 2.4. The word just is sadiq, which means righteous. The righteous shall live by faith. Justified is like someone, it just it literally means someone being made righteous. Someone being made just. Just and righteous is the same. And so that's the meaning of the word itself. But we also have scripture that shows us that same thing. And this is what Romans 5 is really about. So in Romans 5, verses um, 16 to 19, we're going to see that it shows here that justification is being made righteous. Romans 5, 16 to 19. So it says, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So notice, the free gift, the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, referring to the first Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life by one, Jesus Christ. So notice that it was the gift, the free gift, it was referring to as the gift of justification or unto justification in verse 16. And in verse 17, it is the gift of righteousness and it shall reign in the life by one, as, as in by Jesus Christ. So, I noticed there's a, a comment here because it says God's remnant church will keep the law not to be saved, but because they are saved through the blood or the precious blood of the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. So true. We will keep the law not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. That's how we know whether or not we've been justified. Yeah, we can One see the way. if... Well, if we are, if we are breaking the law, we can know for certainty that we are not justified. However, observance of the law can never let someone know that they are justified. The law, the only purpose of it, isn't to show someone's righteousness. By the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law, no one can get the righteousness that is in the law. We know we are saved by the Spirit. And that's uh, also in Galatians, I believe. And so, and the reason for that, too, is because some look at their quote-unquote observance of the law and because of pride, self-righteousness, blindness, etc., think that they are justified when they are really not. And so that's outward observance of the law. That's what Paul had before he was converted. And that's what uh, most of us have and have to deal with. We have to deal with our own self-righteousness. And that's the condition of the Laodicean. Wearing our own skin naked. Wearing nothing but our own skin, a symbol of self-righteousness. So, what we see there in verse 16 and 17, righteousness and justification are parallel. It's even made more clear in verses 18 and 19. It says, Therefore, 
As by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For, as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Notice, free gift came to justification of all. By one, right? Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. You see the parallel there. By Christ's righteousness, Christ's right doing, Christ's obedience, many are made righteous, many are justified. They are made righteous and justified, or receiving justification, are 100% equated. So justification means to be made righteous. And so that's really important to realize. And justification meaning to be made righteous, what is righteousness? We know according to 1 John 5.17 that all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And in uh, 1 John 3.4, Sin is the transgression of the law. Therefore, if sin equals unrighteousness, and sin equals transgression of the law, therefore unrighteousness equals transgression of the law. So if that's stated in the negative, unrighteousness is transgression of the law. Therefore, righteousness is obedience to the law, not transgressing the law. And of course, what we read in Psalm 119, 172 is that all thy commandments are righteousness. So that's what we have. We have all thy commandments are righteousness. Righteousness is what doing righteousness is obedience to the law. Being made righteous is being made obedient to the law. And again, James 2.10 shows that if we break one commandment, we break them all. And if we break one commandment and thus break them all, according to Romans 6.20, we're from righteousness. We have no righteousness. So therefore, being justified, being made obedient to the law, must by necessity mean to be totally and completely obedient to the law. Because once you transgress one, you're guilty of all, and once you're guilty of all, you're free from righteousness. So if justification means being made righteous, transgression means you're free from righteousness, then you cannot be free from righteousness and righteous at the same time. In other words, those things are 100% deadly antagonistic to each other. True opposites. Righteous and not righteous. Those are exact opposites. So, go ahead. Um, so this um, new element that I guess has come to for me, since um, the peace time, that, mm. that justification is the setting up of the kingdom. Right. right. Uh, I sort of never um, that that's a new element in terms of, of that uh, seeing it in that light. So, but now as as we continue on, you see that that is what the the um, this justice for the living, or we move in for in a, in a, in a judgment for the, the living time period is when the Heavenly Family will so provide an environment for people that all that which will transpire within that environment is only righteousness. Amen. It, it can't, it, it, it doesn't facilitate, it doesn't allow um, for any, any crime, you know, when you, when, you know, because it's, because the foundation of the, of the kingdom is righteousness, well then, it's going to be this comprehensive justice that, that um, you know, where we are now, when, when, and you see that now, that's what it was like in the garden, um, that the family made an environment of which only righteousness would be the, the, the experience. Totally. And then, then because of, a, of an act, well, then, then this is out of the garden, and then you can just see this competed, or, or this, com, um, 
um, cyclical pattern that the family is continuing to exert an, an effort to get us back into the garden. To oh, get yeah. us back into a, a, an environment which they, under their constitutional confidential pr um, pledge that they pledge to provide such an environment for us that, that, that no acts of transgression or no acts of disobedience um, would ever choose to want to be um, entertained or engaged in while they're within their boundaries of, of legal control. And, uh, yeah, so what you're saying is actually reminding me of uh, one of the passages which portrays the kingdom sprouting the wilderness. And, you know, it's one of the prophecies of the 9T Reformation. And it's Isaiah 35. And one, in verse 8 it says, And an highway shall be there, referring to the wilderness. A highway shall be there, and a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err. So it's, you know, it's showing this how the kingdom sprouts in the wilderness and before we re uh, return to Zion with singing, we have this way of holiness, this way of righteousness while yet in the lands of the Gentiles and the kingdom truly is being established. Yeah, and I guess the essence for me was just that the, um, this is their pledge to provide for us, this type of environment. Totally, and so that's, you know, it's how, you know, I think Al White says something about heaven starting in the home. <laughs> you know, so our homes are to be those environments that our Heavenly Family is establishing in which anyone can come and hear the gospel and be invited to join the kingdom, you know, be made aware, hey, look, you know, I know you don't realize it, but you are already in a kingdom, but now you're being invited into a better kingdom, you know, the kingdom of death versus the kingdom of life, the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light. You know, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, I'll uh, start off again by reading a quote that Chris just posted. And this is from Testimonies to Ministers, page 93. It says, actually, no, sorry, it's a couple quotes. The first is from page um, 363, Testimonies to Ministers, 363. It says, The righteousness of Christ by faith has been ignored by some, for it is contrary to their spirit and their whole life's experience. Rule, rule. This has been their course of action. Beautiful. Beautiful statement. And then page 93 of Testimonies to Ministry says, Now it has been Satan's determined effort to eclipse the view of Jesus and lead man to look to man and trust to man and be educated to expect help from man. For years, the church has been looking to man and expecting much from man but not looking to Jesus, in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered. Therefore, God gave his servants, elders Jones and Wagner, a testimony that presented the truth as it is in Jesus, which is the third angel's message in clear, distinct lines. Beautiful. Very beautiful. So, We've seen here what justification itself is, right? Justification is being made righteous. Being made righteous is being brought into complete conformity to law to no longer be free from righteousness, but to be free from sin. And we're going to look at a few verses that show that even more clearly. Now, another very important truth to realize is that we are justified, made righteous, by the life of Christ. It is by the life of the Christ of Christ that we are made righteous. And uh, Romans 4 and 5 shows this. I'll just read a few verses. 
Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says, Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So Christ rose from the dead. He was made alive again for our justification. And then Romans 5, verses 9 and 10 says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So justified by his blood. And blood is a symbol of what? Life. Life, right? So we're justified by the blood of Christ. We're justified by the life of Christ. Now, notice verse 10. So again, being justified by his blood. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So notice how saved is parallel to justified. By his life is parallel to by his blood. So you could say we are justified by his life, and we are saved by his blood, or however you want to put it within those terms, they are equated one to another. Justified is the same as saved. By his blood is the same as by his life. So clearly we are justified by the life of Christ. We are made righteous by his life. And his life is what? Sinless life. It's a sinless life. Amen. It's a sinless life. And that is how we can be justified by it. If it wasn't a sinless life, we could not be justified by it, right? Because his life was a justified life. He was justified. He was someone who was righteous. And I forget the exact verse, but there's at least one passage in the New Testament that says that Christ was justified. Not that he had the mind of Satan and had to have it removed from him and then be given a new life. But he was righteous and lived without sin his entire life. So he lived the justified and the sanctified life. And because of his perfect life, he can give that to us, not as a theory, not as something just to be accounted to us in the eyes of God, but as a reality that we die and we live his life. So, if it's anything less than true righteousness, it's pseudo righteousness, it's false righteousness, it's no righteousness at all. Exactly. We can't have a pretend righteousness, exactly. a pretend justification. Yeah, and we'll we'll see some verses that actually specify that more clearly. That it's a very real, practical thing. It's not a theory. It's not just something which takes place in the eyes of God. It's not a change in God. It's a change in us. So, yeah, it's, it's a, justification is a beautiful thing. Now, there's a number of passages that show us this life. Now, we read Romans 4 and 5, or at least a few verses from it. We saw Romans 4, verses 25, and 5, verses 9 and 10, that were justified by the life of Christ. And then we're told in verses 16 to 19 of Romans 5 that justification is being made righteous. And it's called in Romans 5, uh, 18, justification of life. And in Romans 5, 17, it's called righteousness. The gift of righteousness shall reign in life. So it's clearly dealing with the life. And it's the life of Christ given to us for our justification. So, Romans 6, we've gone through this before, but this chapter is very important. This chapter expands a lot on what Paul was talking about in uh, Galatians 2, 15 to 21, which lends more importance to it, perhaps, than some have viewed it, uh, because, again, we saw the importance of Galatians 2, 15 to 21, since it's really the first um, clear declaration of the gospel in the writings of the New Testament, not in order of how it is in our Bibles, but in order of uh, how, you know, 
which book was written first. And within the book of Galatians, this is the first poem where Paul is really setting forth the gospel. So this is the gospel in its purity, and Romans 6 is expanding on this passage in Galatians. So Romans 6 is the gospel in its purity, and this is what it says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? So notice, dying with Christ, Christ died as us. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism in death, in order that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Newness of life. We know that the newness of life is the righteousness of Christ, because, again, when it talks about the same thing in Romans 5.17, it says, Righteousness shall reign in the life. The newness of life, why it's new, is because righteousness is now reigning in it. Whereas before, it was free from righteousness. So notice, we die the death of Christ so that we can be raised in the resurrection of Christ and live in the newness of life. Live righteousness. For, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So if we die with Christ, we die, we are raised again in newness of life. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So notice, the old man is the body of sin. And again, we found out before that the body, the or uh, the commanding force in the life is the will, which is the mind. And the mind operates the body. So the destruction of the body of sin is the same thing as the destruction of the carnal mind, like we read in Romans 8. The carnal mind is the thing that controls the body, making it the body of sin, the body which sins. So that body of sin is the old man, and that is destroyed. Notice, that shows that it's practical. It's not just a change theoretically. It's a change that affects what we do because it changes our mind. It cleanses the conscience, which cleanses the actions. The body of sin is destroyed. The body which is actuated by sin is no longer actuated by sin. So it's not that we, as some teach, that we are uh, the converted man in our minds, but the unconverted man in our bodies. No, the body of sin is destroyed. So, the body of sin is destroyed, that henceforth we do not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Freed from sin, that's an important thing. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. That's, again, an important phrase, and we'll come back to that. But notice, it says that he died to sin. He died unto sin once. Notice that it says in verse 2, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Same thing that we see with Christ. He died, and he died once, but now he lives unto God. I'll just read this uh, one more verse and then make a comment. And we'll uh, likewise, so likewise, like as to what? Like as Christ died to sin and lives with death, having no more dominion over him, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, 
but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's not dead to sin theoretically, but dead indeed unto sin. Indeed. In truth. In reality. I wanted to go back to something you said just a minute ago in regard to some people believe and teach that you can be converted in your mind, but not in your actions. And we were just reading something recently um, posted by, I forget which religious group, but this is, uh, that kind of a teaching is spiritualism. Because what it basically shows is that you can have a soul that exists oh, was, separate and distinct. There's a Baptist group. Yeah, yeah, okay. Separate and distinct from the body. So your soul is converted. is converted and redeemed, which we would also understand to be the mind, the thoughts, the inner man, or whatever. But the body is still sinning. Well, like I said, that is spiritualism because you are only a living soul with the body. The body is part of the of you being a living soul. We all, I think, understand that already. Yeah. But I don't think that we've always understood that it's spiritualism to teach that you can be saved or justified, but yet continue to sin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really... There's another way to look at it, too, is that someone who is in sin according to the scriptures, is spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, Romans 6. But yet, someone who is doing righteousness is alive. So in teaching that someone is righteous, alive, but yet they're sinning, is teaching life in death. You know, the dead are alive. That's spiritualism. And, you know, that's, that's basically what it is. And the whole thing of thinking... And people take it from Romans 7 because they think that Romans 7 is the experience of a true Christian, someone who is converted, and they even misunderstand Romans 7 in that, but the way they look at it is that, oh, Paul was converted in his mind, but not converted in his body. And I, I remember once reading that Adventist book uh, where in it, yeah, the guy was saying that uh, the converted Paul and the unconverted Paul coexisted and lived together in the same body at the same time. And it's really, I mean, talk about double-minded, you know, like James was talking about. It's really, it's confusion, it's spiritualism, it's Babylon, you know, however you want to put it, it's confusion. But the truth of the gospel is that the dead are dead and the alive are alive. And it is just, you know, there's beauty to that. One second here. Okay, uh, Chris posted another thing here. He says, if righteousness uh, ever came by the law, then there would never have been need for Christ to die. People could just have said, all I need to do to get to heaven is to be a good person. What would be the point of Christ dying if he could be justified, if we could be justified by our own good works? Does the law just make them better people? Absolutely not. The only purpose of the law is to show us what sin is. And that he puts in parentheses Galatians 3.19. And that's also, and that was very well said by you, it's, that's also the whole purpose, in essence, of Galatians um, 2.21, which is kind of the climax of Paul's statement to Peter. Let's see here. Go ahead, Lorna. What you just said is so interesting that, this, that we... You know, we tend to be looking for spiritualism outside of ourselves and people who are teaching that that um, the dead are still alive. But here we're dealing with a very subtle form of yeah. spiritualism in yeah. ourselves. Oh, totally. 
Totally. And this, uh, Wagner actually touches on this, perhaps not in as direct a way as Teresa and I just put it, but he does touch on it in the last article of that Wagner on Romans series. He talks about how the real key to this uh, spiritualism as it relates to the state of the dead and so on is that it's teaching life outside of Christ when Christ is our life. The only life is in Christ. You know, and, yeah, it's... In fact, that is what we do. We, we allow for lukewarmness. Right. We allow for that mixture of, okay, I believe it, but I'm not quite there yet in my behavior. Yeah. Oh, you know, and after seeing that, that aspect of how this relates to spiritualism, as well as other aspects, I can see why Ellen White portrays spiritualism as the great heresy of the last days. And I so see it. It really is the great heresy of the last days. And in the future sometime, we'll be looking a little bit more at spiritualism and how that has affected some of our mindsets in relation to some other things as far as practical life and how we think of different things and do different things. I know we've talked about it a lot in relation to lots of things before, how we think of the Godhead, how we think of time and space and angels and reality itself. We've talked about it quite a bit in materiality and so on, but there's more <laughs> where, you know, how it affects us and some of the uh, theories that we have had that are simply not scriptural as a result of spiritualistic ideas that have pervaded Judeo-Christian thinking for many centuries now. I have a comment. Yes, please. Well, we train our children from a very early age in this culture to... Um, be set up to believe things that are mutually exclusive and contradictory and right. irrational. Because, okay, a, a good friend of mine that was raised Adventist who's no longer, who no longer believes in the Bible said, my mom told me about the Easter Bunny and she told me about Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy and about Jesus. And then she told me that the Tooth Fairy wasn't real and the Easter Bunny and blah, 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 you know. And so I just figured Jesus probably wasn't real, too. But, you know, we teach people, we teach kids, and we want them to think rationally. And then we believe, on the one hand, we don't want to lie. Lying is wrong. But then we teach, we tell our kids the most outrageous, irrational lies imaginable, like reindeers flying and, you know, <laughs> a man or a going down chimneys and stuff like that. And then we... we we convince them it's true, and we turn around and say, oh, well, that wasn't really a lie. That was just having fun. But really, it was a lie, and, and you're making them feel ridiculous if they ever believed it to begin with. Right. Yeah, it's really terrible, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's one thing. Just a quick comment on that. My parents didn't really see the point in that. You know, they didn't raise my brother and I to believe in Santa Claus or Easter Bunny or anything like that. Because they figured, you know, they would be lying to us, and then when we find out that it's not true, that we wouldn't trust them, you know. I mean, of course, they still had the other traditions, dealing with Christmas and so on, that they actually should know better. But um, sometimes people just don't think it's a big deal and the rest of it. But, yeah, it's true. We're The way that we are raised in this society is very irrational and very much structured by, well, anti-reality. Um, one second here. Uh, Chris also posted two verses, Romans 7, 16, and 17. It says, If then I do that which I would not, I can send them to the law that is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Yeah, so there's 
in Romans 7, and at some point we'll likely go through uh, those chapters in more detail, Paul is progressively becoming aware, and Paul, again, as an illustration of the experience of everyone, basically, it's a progression of coming to awareness of the dryness of the bones, the death he is in, and his need of a Savior, and then there's the deliverance from the body of sin, the body of death. So, we want to continue on in uh, Romans 6 here, but I'm glad that uh, Teresa brought in again that aspect of spiritualism because it's really important to understand that that is the thing which most likely, more than any other thing, has uh, perverted our understanding of the gospel. Well, it's the original lie, too. It is the original lie, that's true. You won't really die, you're, you're, or you're not really dead. Mm -hmm. You've got some life in you, so you're good. Yeah, this whole thing, you know, comes back to that great positive, you know, goes back to the very beginning. Yeah. And that, in fact, is the original lie of Satan, too, to himself, because he, you know, self-righteousness, what that is, is professing oneself to be God. He was basically claiming self-existence, saying, I can live without God. So that's, that was really... You know, the issue, again, coming back to the issue of life. And life only being in our heavenly family. So, I will continue here in Romans 6. It's Romans 6, verse 12. He says, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So notice, he's talking here not about not sinning, once we receive our glorified bodies and go to heaven for them. He's talking about not sinning now in the present. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under law, but under grace. Now notice, that's expanding on what he was talking about in Galatians. You're not using law as a means of justification, but you're accepting the grace of God, and by that grace, accepting by faith the righteousness of Christ. And sin shall have no more dominion over you because of that. What then? Shall we sin because we want the law? But under grace, God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? So notice, it's if someone yields the members of their body or yields themselves to sin, they're servants of sin. But if you yield yourselves to God, to obedience, you are servants of righteousness, servants of Christ. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And that, of course, is the gospel. So our heart is given to yield to God through the gospel. Being then made free from sin, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness, unto holiness. So notice, it's, he's clearly talking about people in our sinful bodies and what we do with our bodies, how we've done sinful things, but now we are to do righteous things, being free from sin. 
For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness, had no righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Now, I just want to point out here, Paul here is talking about those who receive justification and how, you know, what's the fruit of the things which we're now ashamed of? And he says, death. That reminds me of Paul in Philippians, I believe it's chapter 2 or 3, where he's talking about his own experience. And he talks about all these good things that he was doing and how he accounted it all but done. To use a mild translation. He counted it nothing. It was pointless. All of it was worthless. You know, so he was ashamed of his own works in the past. Verse 22. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit and the holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, some people believe and teach that Paul started this whole thing of justification by faith and that Paul ended up disregarding the law and throwing it aside. Oh, but not Jesus. Jesus stayed true to the law. And this is kind of what the Ebionites ended up proclaiming. And this is what you hear some people proclaim today. But what Paul was saying here, where does he get that from? You know, statements like being, uh, and there's many parallels here, but he talks about being free from sin. And he said, free indeed. And he goes on, so on and so forth. And he says, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, the servants to are to whom ye obey, whether it's sin unto death, or of righteousness unto God. And that is actually going back to Christ. And what he said in John chapter 8. So let's actually go back here to John chapter 8, verse uh, 32 to 37. And we're going to see the same teaching from our Messiah himself, Christ himself. Uh, starting at verse 32, Christ speaking, he says, And ye shall know the truth, John 8, 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So hearing the gospel, be made free. Remember Paul just talked about with the heart obeying the doctrine that was delivered to you? The gospel, the truth, right? So you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The question is, free from what? They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in all forever, for the Son abideth. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So what are we free from? Sin. What were they? Sin, thank you. <laughs> thank You're you welcome. so much. Free from it was right? good off cute. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Carol. Yeah, I mean, here it's clear it's, it's being servants of sin and needing to be free from sin. And he doesn't say, and you'll be free in the eyes of God. He could have said that. You'll be free from sin in how I choose to look at you. He could have said that. But instead, he says, you'll be free indeed. It's sure. It's a true freedom from sin. Chris also posted here, Second Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. And Galatians 3.22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe by believing in the righteousness of Christ 
we are accounted righteous, is what Chris says, the last part. By believing in the righteousness of Christ, we are counted righteous. And we are counted righteous because by believing in the righteousness of Christ, if we truly believe, we are actually transformed. Like it said in, in the previous verse, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that we might be made the righteousness of God. So we are actually made righteous by Christ, by receiving his life, dying, his death. In other words, we, when we die, we receive the penalty of the sins that we have committed. The penalty is paid for. We've already received it. We've already died to self. And then we have the life of Christ as our new, resurrected, sinless, everlasting life. And then... Like it says in, uh, I believe it's Romans 3.25, by receiving that experience, our sins of the past are remission. We have remission of the sins of the past because we've already paid the penalty. We've already died to self. Those sins have been paid for because Christ died and we accepted his death as our own. The carnal mind was put to death. So notice, that was Christ teaching the same thing. Now, I want to read the next verse, verse 37, and we're going to connect this with a couple more scriptures and we're going to close off. Well, there was one thing I just wanted to come to mind real quick. Yeah. And I don't have the book with me now in this room. don't know if I can even put my finger directly on it. But in the message brought by Jones and Wagner that Ellen White said was the true message of the third angel's message, you know, righteousness by faith, they had the truth. There is a comment made, and he says, and he's talking about how the gospel teaches sinlessness. And so he says, one of you may say, well, that doesn't leave any room for any sin. He's like, that's exactly right. It doesn't leave any room for any sin in the life of a justified person. And that was Wagner, uh, I believe, it was the studies in Romans 7, but it could have been Romans 6. But it's in the articles that Teresa will send them. Yeah. So you'll, you'll end up getting it. And so, just to continue here, with a, we just want to cover a few more scriptures to connect with this and really try to get a better understanding of verse 17 here, and then we're going to close off. Well. So, the next verse, again, Christ just told them, you know, you must be free and I'll make you free indeed. Uh, the truth shall make you free, and you shall be free indeed. I know, this is verse 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Notice something, he's telling them the cause of their servitude to sin. He said, my word has no place in you. Now, this is interesting because notice, what we've seen here, according to Romans 6, in order for us to be justified by faith, and what being justified by faith is, is actually receiving a new life. One of the symbols for that was baptism, dying in Christ's death and raising in his resurrection, the death and resurrection of Christ. Another symbol of that is just what he's talking about here. You must be born again. You know, in verse 35 of John 8, he says that, you know, a servant doesn't abide forever, but a son abides forever. Becoming a son, that's showing that we must be born children of God. And that's what we're told in uh, John chapter 3. You must be born again. Born again to be adopted children of God. So right there, verse 35, is an allusion to being born again in uh, John chapter 8. That's another symbol of becoming a new person with a new life. Death and resurrection, and also being reborn. And that's both symbols of justification by faith. Now in verse 37, he also said that the cause of their issue was that his word had no place in them. Now this is shown also in 1 Peter 1, verses 22 and 23. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23, 
and also verse 25. 22, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, just want to point out here, that's clearly talking about someone who's justified. Because in First John, uh, all throughout, really, it talks about someone who is born of God loves their brother. And that if you're not born of God, you do not actually love your brother. That's in First John 1, First John 2, actually, First John 2 and First John 3. That's where he talks about that. Now, what we see here is that in uh, Peter, when it talks about this, that's clearly talking about a born-again person, which is clear again in verse 23. It says, being born again, you know, you're purified, you have unfeigned love for your brethren, love one another with a pure heart, so it's a new heart. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So notice, Christ said that their problem was that they didn't have the word. The word did not find place in them. This is also the parable of the seed. Now, notice here, he says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. So we're born again by the word of God, which liveth and endureth forever. So it's the word in us that we're born again by and that that is the seed. You know, that's the male symbol, the seed. The female symbol is the womb, which is what God is about. So it's by the Word and by the Spirit, by Christ and the Holy Ghost, the masculine and the feminine, the seed and the womb. And we see here, born of the Spirit, born of the seed, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So what we see here is that Christ is pointing out you must be born again. And actually, I'm going to skip verse 25 now for sake of time. But the reason why I was going to mention it is because it shows that this word of truth is the gospel. It's the truth. The same truth Christ is talking about in John 8. And that it is an everlasting gospel. But now, in 1 John 3, this comes together again. So we saw, again, justified is the same as Dying self, being uh, receiving a new life, the death and the resurrection, baptism. And we saw with Christ, he said uh, in John 8 and in John 3, that he's uh, saying that we must be born again. And uh, that's by the word. Now in 1 John chapter 3, the it says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him. That's the same seed, the word of God, the gospel, the truth. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So notice here, when Christ was talking to these people in John 8, we won't read the whole thing, but he ends up telling them that they're children of the devil. And you know, that's in verse 44, that they're children of the devil <clears throat> and that they don't have the word in them, and so on. In John 3, he says that being born again and not sinning because the seed remains in us is what manifests the children of God and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And of course, in verse 6 of First John 3, Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth, hath not seen him, neither hath known him. So Christ came to take away our sin, to free us from sin. And that, just in the verses that we've looked at here, again, it shows quite clearly from the Bible that justification by faith is indeed by faith of Christ and it is, you know, truly being made free from sin. Now, I think I'll just read 
uh, one more verse to close off. And this is Galatians 2, verse 20. I know there's more verses in between that we didn't read yet. We didn't read 18 and 19, but verse 20 says the same thing that we've looked at. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's, that's the summary of the gospel, justification by faith. We cannot be justified by works in any way. We have to, again, see the dryness of our bones, but in that it's encouragement because we can see that it's the righteousness of Christ. We can accept his life. And that truly is the gospel. And seriously, just going through reading this in the past few days, focusing on these verses in Galatians, man, there is so much joy in the gospel. So, so much joy. Amen, the viewer says that is a favorite verse, totally. All right, well, Heavenly Family, we want to thank you so much for the gospel. We want to thank you, Father and Mother, for sending your Son to us. Thank you so much for sending him to live a perfect life and to live a complete human life, even to the death. To just live out your righteousness, depending fully on you, even while in our sinful flesh. We thank you so much for sending him. Thank you so much, brother, for so willingly, so willingly coming. And thank you for raising from the dead. And also, as well, it is so amazing that when you came, you actually took the sins of the world upon you, and you put to death the flesh, and you abolished and destroyed the carnal mind. So that if we are willing to die in you, that you, of course, in sending your sister and in her giving us your life, that you can give us your life if we die your death. So, Heavenly Family, I just want to ask now for the death of every carnal mom that may be here today and that, you know, anyone in the branch or anyone aware of the message of justification or everyone out there, we ask for the death of carnal moms, everyone, which indeed is asking for the death of the mind of Satan in them. And we ask for the newness of life in each one of these people. And uh, I, I want to ask that every day that a way gets prepared for you to be able to impress upon the hearts of all these people how much you love them and how eager you are to just give them your life. And how amazing it is that the best of us so to speak, would only die for a friend. But you have died for those who are your enemies, who trust your works of Satan. So it truly is beautiful. Thank you so much for having family. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for this reminder of the power of creation. That same creative energy and power which you also exert for redemption and in redeeming us from sin, you also restore marriage, restore life, restore love. <laughs> and I just want to thank you so, so much. It's truly the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father. Father, in the name of your children, in the name of God, we ask all these things and we thank you. Amen. 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 All right. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll be on tomorrow again. And I hope you all have a really good Sabbath and wonderful rest. Not only rest from the labors of the week, but rest from the burden of the carnal mind. Freedom, that's what this house is about. All right, so farewell, everyone. Love you all.